Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we have a man who here who's been through a lot and has a lot of experience as well as creativity. And we're going to talk about finding calm amidst the turmoil of loss, which I know a lot of you have had loss and would like to know some of the ways that you can find calm. Heidi, would you like to introduce our guest? Sure, Mom, I'd love to. And I really like the title of this show today. Our guest today is Roger Hutchison. He is a best-selling author and illustrator of nine books, including The Painting Table, My Favorite Color is Blue Sometimes, Faces a Love Story, The Art of Calm, Spiritual Exercises for the Anxious Soul. We'll talk more about that. And in 2014, Mom, he received the Governor's Order of the Silver Crescent Award which is South Carolina's highest civilian honor for contribution and achievement within the community. Welcome to the show, Roger. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here. Thank you Uh, so much. Thanks so much for joining us today. One of the things that I know that you talk a little bit about is the loss of your world after a hurricane, right? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Certainly. um, We moved to Houston in 2017 bought our home in 2017 and in 2017 were impacted we were impacted by hurricane harvey Uh, we were not impacted directly um, with the storm damage but two weeks following the storm the foundation on our home failed Mm -hmm. and when that happened it began to break uh, our walls and the foundation in the home shifted and our plumbing broke All of that uh, led to my own personal foundation failing. Um, I ended up experiencing significant uh, anxiety and panic. And so uh, it was a loss of the world I knew before. And so, you know, the big part of that is, is that it it was a journey and it's a journey I'm still on. And um, I've learned a lot about myself in that time. It it does, like you said, mom, remind me of what happens, what happened when Scott died, you know, my brother and my father who recently died a couple of years ago, you you kind of lose the world you once knew and your identity. And, and it's, it's very anxiety provoking. Like you said, Roger, it's like, who am I now? I've had this tragedy or this, this major adversity, or in your case, major loss. Yeah. And part of what I learned in that is that, you know, I had to learn how to see that loss as a gift. And so I have really uh, engaged with the loss of who I was. Uh, I've learned a lot about myself. I've engaged with the loss that I experienced and then, you know, really feel called to to help people navigate uh, a world that is really, really anxious <laughs> and, um, and seems to be getting more anxious and it can be any kind of loss. You know, it's so interesting because you just said a world that is anxious. I feel anxious when you said that. It's yeah. amazing how just those words That's right. can, can create, you know, that feeling, how your body does respond to those words now so you're you're in the hospital you're there in anxiety you're having a breakdown what was the first thing you did that was helpful do you remember i remember that the first thing that i did was cry Mm -hmm. and i think that it was the healthiest thing that i've ever done when i i didn't try to fix it i wanted to fix it you know that's my tendency i'm a people pleaser i don't you know, I, I, I want to help and, and help others. I just had to sort of give in to the grief uh, that I was feeling. And I cried a lot. And I remember just curling up in my wife's lap and um, just you know, That's interesting because we know physically that there are actually chemicals in the tears that are relaxing to the body. That's right. Well, and I remember somebody said to me, um, 
I didn't have a great experience in the ER um, and having a mental health episode, you go to the ER, but they really don't do a lot for you in the ER. I mean, they, they're there to, to deal with injuries that are seen. And, and often these injuries are injuries that, that are not visible. And I just remember somebody saying to me that tears uh, are energy that need to be released. And that was very, very freeing to me. And, and especially for a, a, a male, you know, growing up in, in a world where, you know, thankfully that's changing, I think, a, a lot, um, you know, to be well, able to. That's, about that's what I'm hearing, Roger. That's what I'm impressed about, because we see oftentimes that men are taking care of their spouses. And in your case, you were able to show your emotions and curl up in your wife's yeah. Lap, she was able to comfort you, which I yeah. love hearing. Yeah, she did. And it, you know, part of what it, it, it was also hard on her. Yeah. Sure. You know, it was really hard on her. I mean, there's a part in my book that I write about in the opening chapter that we're sitting on a bench and I am sobbing. I couldn't help it. I didn't know where that was coming from, but it was coming. <laughs> and I remember her later after I, I was doing much better she had sort of prayed that a plane would crash into us or something. It, life was just so heavy and she was not used to me being in that situation. You know, we were navigating also a, a having a, we have a daughter who's now 21. And so that was a hard time. So I know that you went on to uh, help uh, paint with children at Sandy Hook, right? I did. You know, it was an experience that changed me at a cellular level. Uh, it, 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 um, I remember, so I have a practice that I do that my grandmother's kitchen table, when my grandmother died, the only thing I wanted was her kitchen table. It's where we would gather as children. I remember hiding under that table and watching my grandmother and my grandfather's feet as they washed the dishes. It was like an altar and, and it came to, to live in our home and I would paint that became my painting table. And so that practice, I was invited to bring the idea of, of how to navigate grief using color uh, and, and was invited to go uh, from a colleague in uh, Newtown to go. And we ended up spending a Friday evening there working with over 50 children who were in the school at the time of the shooting. The Painting Table was my first book, and it uh, really talks about the, the kitchen table then my favorite color is blue. Sometimes that book, it, it, it actually has continued to be a bestseller in the sense that people grieve and, and that one seems to really um, work with folks. And it just truly takes the idea of red is the color of love. Red is also the color of anger, you know, or the color purple, the, the purple helps us remember. In the back of the book, there are 50 ways to uh, remember someone you've lost and loved. And um, can you give us a few of those, Roger? I oh, love sure, them. sure. Well, I love the whole idea of, of helping others. And so my whole my thought is, you know, uh, if you've lost someone you love, cook their favorite meal and invite friends over and, and have a party. Uh, share that meal together. Uh, other ideas are, you know, I, I love the idea of taking a painting and you talk about, uh, you, you take a painting, you paint it, that symbolizes that friendship. And one of the things I encourage people then to do is to tear it up. And then when they tear it up, put it back together in a new way, almost a collage of sorts. And so it doesn't mean that that, 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 that painting remains, but it looks different. And so uh, oftentimes from the broken pieces, from the torn pieces, from those, uh, you can create something even more beautiful than, than maybe what was there before, or at least a way to honor and remember and celebrate the life of that person. I love it. So you, I know that you have a, a religious calling. You're very involved with your church, right? I am. I'm, I've been, I'm a lifelong member of the Episcopal Church. Um, I'm a child of a, a priest, clergy person, and and now I serve as a Christian educator in a, a, a large Episcopal church here in Houston. And so what do you recommend and how do you work with people who've had a recent loss? Well, one of the things I, I believe the church has done a lot of damage for people who are trying to grieve. 
who are navigating grief. I think, you know, there, there's the response of, you know, they're in a better place or, you know, all of that is really hurtful. And God has a plan. Nothing breaks my heart more than hearing that or angers me more than that. And so some of the, the things that we do here, the longest night service. And so we have a service where people come and, uh, you know, Christmas is really hard. The holidays are really hard for people who have lost someone. So we invite everybody who has lost somebody to come and, and we have a really beautiful, quiet, meditative service where people can just be present in their grief. And so we encourage people to do that. Um, I, so, I love this. Don't you, you love, know, I love this idea? It's a beautiful thing. Honoring and, so, honoring and acknowledging and creating space. Yes. For them. And our whole thing is, I think, too, that I love doing is that there's nothing I can do to fix it. Uh, as I said, I'm a, I am love to be a fixer. It's just the, my nature. Uh, one of the greatest gifts that I was ever taught is by somebody who is grieving, who had experienced a terrible loss, who said, please don't tell me it'll all be OK. Please don't tell me these just hold space for me right now. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that means you don't have to say anything. Right. Maybe you just hold my hand or you're just in the space with me mm -hmm. and, and, you know, or ask me about my relative or my friend or my, you know, let's, let, let's not hide them away. Let's talk about it. So the other thing I can say too, real quick in, in the Episcopal church, something we, we do with funerals. Uh, we don't, when we have a funeral, we call it a celebration of the life of that's on the cover of the bulletin. And so it's, it's, it, it, the whole thing is a sort of celebration of that person's life. So we, we, that's how we, we navigate things here. What do you do personally? Sure. sure. So the art of calm, and I'm really excited about this project. I'm a photographer. So what happened, what I can share, this is just one of my, my practices and anybody can do this. I, had to go home when it was COVID, you know, we, we had to, to, to go home and, and that was isolating for so many people. And for me, I needed to go for a walk. So I started going walking and I began to take pictures with my, my phone. And first it was sort of the things I'd see around me, but then I set myself a, a, a goal of, of just looking within 10 feet circumference of where I, where I was and within that 10 feet space, I begin to notice things. I begin to notice uh, in the sidewalk, an imprint of a leaf. And I'd take a photo of that or someone's initials. And so what I begin to, to do is take photos of that, share that with others. And I felt like an archeologist sort of digging uh, uh, for uh, memories and, and stories that, that I saw within that space right around me. And so I began to do that and I'd walk a mile and I'd walk more. And I ended up most of COVID walking six miles a day. And it would, I would take pictures of the sidewalk and, and fire hydrants. And I would just notice patterns and colors and shadows and, and light. And so that has become so very central to me. So my, my greatest uh, way of finding peace is to, um, to go for a walk. Mm -hmm. I'm spending a lot of time learning to see and not just look. We do a lot of looking. It's it's kind of like a walking meditation, right? It is. Contemplative photography, walking meditation. For me, that has been uh, incredibly important is to um, be active, have a, have a routine. You know, I, I, when I experience the anxiety, I had to, and I think people who are experiencing grief and are in the midst of, of grieving, um, one of the best things I ever did was get up in the morning and, and take a shower. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the simple act, I don't mean simple, it's actually really hard to get out of the bed in the morning sometimes. And so for me, I set my alarm and I had to do it. And it would be a little bit cold and it would kind of get my body going. And so, um, and yoga for pregnant women which is kind of funny, but when I was in my bed and I couldn't wait, get Roger, out. wait, let me, let me stop for a minute. Yeah. Roger, yeah. Yeah. Did Roger say that he's doing yoga for pregnant women. Uh, yes, I did. I did say that. And I wanted to tell you real quick why. So I'm talking, I'm talking about crying and I'm talking about curling up in my wife's lap, all these things. But what happened is, as I was laying in my bed, I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. My body didn't want to work. Um, I was a hopeless and I needed something. So I, I, turned on the phone and I said, I need something for like 
just to get me moving. And so I happened upon, I was looking for chair exercises or something. And I came upon yoga for pregnant women. And I thought, nobody's looking. I'm going to try <laughs> this. And you know what? I write about it in my book. It was one of the best things that I've ever done. One of the best things I've ever done. It made me chuckle a little bit, but actually all it was was stretching mm-hmm. and, uh-huh. and moving gentle. your body. And it was gentle and it was meditative and it was honoring the life of a baby that was within you. And for me, it was honoring that child that was within me that 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 was hurting that was lost so uh, you know it became very symbolic and powerful to me I laugh wow. about it but it was really beautiful that is kind of an amazing thought I love that me yeah. too yeah so that was really special for me it's something that everybody can do yeah definitely definitely and and I'm you know people have said Roger you're pretty candid and vulnerable when you share those things part of it is it makes me laugh yeah. I mean, I began to find some joy in that. And when I tell people, yeah, I did yoga for pregnant women. I mean, come on, that's pretty funny. And my daughter was so embarrassed. She was like, please, dad, do not do that. Um, <laughs> but but people just relax when I'm able to share that kind of thing with them. Tell us where people can find your book and your website right. and all your information. Sure. My website is rogerhutchisonbooks.com. And you can see some of my photography on there. It lists all my books and bio and all of that kind of thing. Um, Our books are available anywhere you order books. Um, You know, any bookstore. I'm a big fan of local independent bookstores. So if you if you have a local bookstore, go check check it out. Um, If you just Google my name, you'll make sure you leave the N out of it. Everybody says Hutchinson. It's Hutchison. And um, you'll find me. And I love hearing from folks. And so reach out. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on our show today. I'm so honored and I'm grateful for the work that you all do. Uh, Thank you, Roger. I love your energy. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.